Madrid in 2017. Her current interests are in British and Irish book history around 1603 and 1707. Dr. Mackenzie has presented many papers in the UK and Ireland and has featured on BBC Radio 4 and STVC, The People History Show. Uh, with that, I'm welcoming her to our virtual stage. Please begin. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to present today. Um, I really do appreciate it. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint um, uh, today. Um, on the basis that uh, where I'm sort of discussing uh, it being the northwest of England during the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, I don't have any pictures of ministers. I don't have any pictures of even the Manchester classes sitting, and I don't have a picture of uh, the, the, the printing press or anything like that. So, um, and but really this does emphasize the point that I want to get across today, which is actions rather than words, which might seem an unnatural approach uh, in, a, in a sort of conference that deals with the printing press. So today I would like to offer a reassessment of the role of the printing press within the working lives of the ministry attached to the Manchester Presbyterian classes or the classical presbytery, um, but also the Cheshire Association, which uh, ran from 1647 to 1660. In doing so, this will be a small case study which aims to reassess the true place and value of the printed word within the ministry and the daily lives of those ministers, leading to wider questions about the true pla place of printed books within the lives of people uh, who are living far away from the major printing centres in Stuart Britain. Uh, such as London, Edinburgh and Dublin. This paper will recognise the value, uh, the valuable works written by Presbyterian ministers in the northwest of England. The books uh, are going to be placed in the wider national debates, but it will also exercise caution as to their true impact and value based upon a recognition of the wider methods of communication available. And also the realities of the da daily life within the ministry and the classes itself, but also the restrictions and roadblocks that lay in their path. It is also a case study which will allow us to see the true value and place of the printed word in the English provinces, particularly in a region which Puritan contemporaries saw as remote, where the propagation of the gospel was seen as a necessity to combat the strong presence of Catholicism and irreligion in the area. It will do this by focusing on two pamphlets by two different authors, which will give us an insight into the complexity of the relationships and contextual influences on the authors and the relationship with the printing press in London. And this includes uh, looking at national events, local religious networks, local societal conditions, pressures of their daily lives and individual circumstances. The first pamphlet which will be examined is John Tilsley's A Copy a true copy of the petition of 12,500 and upwards of the well-affected gentlemen, ministers and freeholders and others of the County Plenatinate of Lancaster, published in London in 1646, uh, which preceded the founding of the Bury Presbyterian classes in 1647. This paper will then move on to consider the wider picture when looking at Cheshire and uh, particularly the Cheshire-based minister Adam Martindale, in his, and his uh, an antidote to the poison of the times, which was published in Manchester in 1653. And this is, was published when Martindale stepped into national political uh, religious debates, but it also uh, is after a period of, of personal and professional turmoil. In doing so, in doing so, uh, this paper hopes uh, to highlight that uh, printing in the English provinces was a highly complex affair at a national, local and individual levels, but also the act of printing itself was arguably a sideline, an incidental act, and we'll argue that in the daily lives and uh, in the daily lives of these ministers, other methods of communication were far more effect effective and important. It will conclude by suggesting that perhaps historians have perhaps put too much emphasis on the printed words in the 17th century, uh, which has misaligned our perceptions of reality of day-to-day -day communication in 17th century Britain and Ireland. 
So uh, to look at John Tilsley as a true copy of the petition, at face value, this pamphlet looks like an appeal by a small group of Lancashire based Presbyterian ministers. It's printed in London and it's dedicated to the Lords in the Commons. It appears as a singular dialogue between the province of Lancaster to the seat of power in London, to both Houses of Parliament, but this is, this is very deceptive. Um, this, is, this is a printed uh, petition which engages personal, local, national and transnational issues all at once, and is a reminder that even seemingly provincial pam pamphlets can engage with important national debates. It is also a multifaceted pamphlet which all at once deals with several issues, cutting across religious, political uh, and social spectrum. So I'm going to rattle the full title of the pamphlet, which is on the front page. Um, so this is quite a mouthful, so bear with me. A true copy of the petition of the 12,500 and upwards of the well-affected gentlemen, ministers, freeholders, and others in the County Palatinate of Lancaster. To the Right Honourable House of Peers and the Honourable House of Commons assembled in the High Court of Parliament together with some true, true and material observations concerning the petition, avouched by the adventurers of the petition, rectifying the half stupendous copy lately printed under the name of a new birth of the city of Remonstance, and invalidating the amovations of the nameless petitioner, of the nameless publisher thereof, as, all, as also a particular clear and satisfactory answer to the said abrogations. Uh, showing the falsehood and frivolousness thereof, vindicating the petition and the petitioners from all injurious charges, imputations, aspirations, adverimenter, showing the harmony and apprehensions and desires betwixt and renowned City of London and the aforesaid county, and what is repute the famous remembrance of that remonstrance that that city is in amongst the well affected of that county, reflecting reflecting the lawlessness, the licentiousness, and anti-parliamentary anti practice of this nameless sectary, and thereby pointing out the sectarian spirit. The pamphlet was printed in London and sold in St Paul's Churchyard. It's clear that there are multiple dialogues taking place. To start off, it was appealed from the middling sort to the peers and members of Parliament in Westminster. This pamphlet also takes on a form of a legal dispute. Uh, surrounding what constitutes the truth and is an appeal against slander from a nameless person. And this is directed to the highest court in the land, the High Court of Parliament. This pamphlet is also an answer to another pamphlet, a defence against a nameless attacker. It is, also, it is also to prove that the highest court in the land shows the position of the well-affected in the county of Lancaster. On a philosophical level, it is an assertion of the truth against falsehood, as well as confirmation of the reality of the people which had signed the petition versus the nameless troll that hides in the shadows. This is obviously a sentiment with which our current age in social, uh, with social media we can identify with. It also alludes to the harmony between the centre and the periphery by asserting that the City of London and the gentlemen of London are on the same page as the classical Presbyterians. As I've already stated in my monograph, The Sunling Covenant of the Three Kingdoms and the Cornwallian Union, this pamphlet is part of the Three Kingdoms coordinated effort to boost the Anglo Scottish alliance, mirrored in the groundswell of the local networking that can be seen in England and other parts of England and over in Ulster. It is a defence of the Sunling Covenant and traditional governance. Referring to the dear brethren of Scotland who its states contributed significantly to the war effort and the honourable houses. Indeed, it is written and published in London, reflective not just of the purpose of the pamphlet as it is an appeal to the House of Lords, but as part of this wider Anglo-Scottish printing network in London. At a local level, this pamphlet is reflective of the establishment of both the Manchester Presbyterian classes in 1646 and the Bury classes in 1647. In essence, this pamphlet, although written by ministers from the County of Lancaster, touches on a multifaceted, multifaceted aspects, both at a local and national levels. 
Instead of a straight line from Manchester to London, it is a complex weave of interconnected issues, perspectives, and arguments. However, again, the national and transnational elements have perhaps distracted us from another aspect of the pamphlet, which is a fierce dispute over the success, the validity, and actions of the Westminster of the Manchester classes at a local level especially its actions in persuading people to sign the petition as, nameless author, as the nameless authors of the competing pamphlet accuses ministers of the classes of being forceful in their actions. Indeed, this part of the pamphlet highlights that the act of printing is not the strongest way to communicate in Lancashire, but it, it is reading with care to the public, which is far more important, particularly so that people can understand what they were signing. It has also gave the minister the opportunity to explain the key arguments and to answer any questions that the populace may have. Indeed, the details of the petition were discussed amongst the ministers of Lanc Lancaster by letter, principally through the minister Edward G, one of the key founders of the Manchester Classical Presbytery, who would later be one of the leading spokespeople against Republican engagement in 1650. Again, this highlights the importance of other forms of communication and a direct role in disseminating the petition. Furthermore, the action of subscribing was a physical action and that was the foremost activity. The signature is collected by Mr. Hollingworth's church, was then published and hung on the church rather than printed. Um, again, there's this emphasis on action and not the printed word. The nameless critic. Uh, to which this um, pamphlet answers, the nameless critic suggested that Hollingworth and his fellow ministers just read out the best bits of the petition to fool people in signing. Indeed, the actions of the gathering of signatures were part of a heated dispute with the classes defending its actions and carrying the petition from house to house, which the nameless critic suggested was unfair. It states that signing petition in a private house is indeed lawful, and that's what classical Presbyterians argue. They argue that the, the physical signing of the petition within the house is lawful. The petition is also sent by post, which, nameless, which a nameless critic objected to on the grounds of secrecy. John Tilsley himself claims to be a credible and transparent witness to events, which is contrasted with the nameless critic. It is clear that John Tilsley's printed pamphlet was very much after these events and a defense of these actions uh, taken by the Manchester classes, rather than the whole set of events around the dissemination of the petition to the county. So the, 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 the printing of this pamphlet about the petition in London is after all these events are taking place. Indeed, you could even suggest that the actions of disseminating the petition's details by letter, then reading them in public, are entirely separate from this printed defence of their actions. Indeed, printing was not the central part of the process, but very much an afterthought on the sidelines. However, there is another angle to consider, namely the wider picture. Just how important was this dispute over the petition? And, it, and how reflective was it of, over, or uh, reflective of it was to the day-to-day -day lives of the Manchester classes and its overall aims in the county. In reality, this pamphlet is not much so a reflection of the overall work of the classes, but is a dispute between two individuals, namely John Tilsley and his nameless critic. If we examine the records of the Manchester classes in August 1646, the month that this uh, petition is published in London, uh, we find that the Manchester classes are grappling with very mundane run-of-the-mill issues by Presbyterian standards. Poor ministers, parishioners having premarital sex, approval of elders, and a case of incest um, uh, amongst uh, a married couple, uh, which they then, of course, made the marriage null and void. Um, and also there was a case of slander and there were the usual ministerial ordinations. It is clear that uh, this dispute over the petition between John Tilsley and the nameless critic bore absolutely no connection to the day-to-day -day business of the Manchester classes. Therefore, as historians, we have to be cautious about our emphasis and uh, uh, of our importance of print in the day-to-day -day lives of organizations and institutions at the time. So now we've looked at print 
uh, pleased to print in its institutional context and look at pleased, pleased to print at an individual level. At first sight, Adam Martindale's antidote to the poison of the times is one of the countless pamphlets in the early 1650s, which are very upset with the growth of sectaries and the apparent religious chaos of the English Commonwealth. However, there's a lot in this pamphlet that can teach us about relationships between print and the Presbyterian ministers, such as Adam Martindale, who were part of the Presbyterian networks in the northwest of England during the 1650s. This particular pamphlet had a purpose. It was to be used as a practical catechism in parishes throughout the northwest of England. Uh, as it was printed in London, but it was, um, but it, although it was printed in London, uh, it was to be sold in the bookshop of Thomas Smith in Manchester. So this was certainly for a local audience. For, the, for its ease of use, it was written in the form of questions and answers so that it can be easily be spoken and discussed between ministers and their parishioners. However, although being a printed book, it is spoken, uh, the spoken word does predominate in other ways, um, such as, the, uh, such as uh, for, uh, it was mainly used for preaching in his own parish. But actually the book itself, although printed in London and sold in the bookshop in Manchester, started in a handwritten form and was orally dispersed throughout the northwest of England. The word about the effectiveness of the handwritten form uh, spread to other parishes and he found that there was a certain demand for this catechism. So Martindale started writing uh, handwritten copies and handwritten transcriptions of the one that he had created for his own parish and copies to share with others. He admits that the only reason why he decided to get this printed in London was because the demand was so great that he feared mistakes in the multiple written transcriptions that he was being asked to write. Um, so that's why he, he got it printed in London and of course then the book was brought up to, to, to be sold to Manchester. Um, here again, uh, we emphasize that print is at the end of the communication process rather than the beginning. However, in contrast to the petition above, it was largely disconnected from the work of the uh, Cheshire Association and the Manchester classes. Martindale hopes that print will aid the learning of those too poor to buy, too busy to read, too weak to understand uh, more large and learned treaties. But again, caution has to be exercised even in this process um, where oral dissemination of the catechism predominates um, here and it's the, the oral dissemination predominates rather than the written and printed form. Again, this is a reminder that the oral means of communication vastly outweigh the printed form, even if the printed version could be bought locally. It is a reminder that not everyone could afford books, read, or even understand the arguments, even if they could read. This book is clearly designed to form a part of a teaching process or an exploratory discussion between ministers and the parishioners. It is an open-ended discussion to ensure the understandings of the key tenets of the Christian faith. However, we have to further contextualize this pamphlet by asking, how does it fit into the overall day-to-day -day function of Martindale's ministry at an individual level? When examining his life, it is clear that the printed work was the result of a disputation between himself and the independent minister of Duckinfield and Mr. Eaton. Again, this work was printed after the theatrical disputation took place, which again highlights that the oral dissemination of the communication predominated. It also highlights that the process of Presbyterian independent disputation in Cheshire, um, that written transcriptions uh, were traded to try and counter the independent success in preaching. Um, writing these transcriptions and printing them is a secondary means of defense against uh, the sectaries. It's the oral uh, means of defense that are more important and they are the primary means of engagement. It is also quite interesting to know that Martindale had written and transcribed this uh, particular uh, uh, printed work when he was sick. Um, so this would uh, suggest that um, if he had been doing his normal 
uh, ministry duties. The, the pamphlet itself never would have been written, let alone published in London. We do know that in the early 1650s, he was preaching twice on a, mon twice on a Sunday. He was catechizing, he was visiting the sick. Um, he was preaching at funerals and baptisms and uh, he was giving sermons at various private chapels around Cheshire. Um, by his own admission, he was extremely busy. He even traveled far and wide preaching in Staffordshire, twice yearly and twice in Lancashire. The lecture in, he had a lecture in Chester and he had four different lectures on the go in Cheshire all at once. Again, through this contextualization, it allows us to reassess the proper place of print in the ministry of Adam Martindale. It was a sideline for which he only managed to work due to illness. Therefore, it is questionable if he, if he had been working at full, at full pelt under normal circumstances, whether the pamphlet would have been written at all. So today I have tried to highlight that in order to understand the proper place of print in the English provinces, we have to see the wider picture and actively contextualize the individual pamphlets. Whilst appreciating and admitting our own love of books as academics, we have to admit that other forms of communication such as letters, oral dissemination and written transcriptions were still dominant. Indeed, this paper has shown that in these two cases, they were both in their own ways disjointed from the everyday actions and concerns of the authors, the institutions and their networks. Indeed, it appears that printing books was a sideline and not integral to the Presbyterian ministry in the northwest of England, where the actions of indig individuals were far more important than static black ink on a piece of paper. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kirsten, for your presentation. Um, our second speaker is Joe Saunders. Joe is, uh, is a PG student at the University of York, researching a social history of the English print trade around 1557 and 1666 using wheels. He's interested in all aspects of the trade from material culture to networks of credit. In his master's, he carried out social network analysis on wheels of members of the stationers community in London during the 1620s and 30s. His first publication, uh, which comes from the research, is a chapter on female agency within the stationary social network and is due for publication this year. Please, Joe, you can begin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to to try sharing my screen and make sure everything works okay. So if I can just test that, and then um, if you if if you can all just say that you can see me okay um, and and hear me. So we hear you very well, very well. Very really well, excellent. Yeah. And can you still hear me? Yeah, and we can see the screen. The Excellent. Screen. Good. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, excellent. Uh, so I'm I'm Joe, and I'm going to talk about the environments of the English print trade in the first decades of the 17th century. And this research is from my PhD, where I'm using wheels to study the trade. And I'm going to show you all a wide understanding of environments we must have uh, when thinking about this trade. Um, and I hope there'll be something here for all of you, um, whenever and wherever your focus lies, uh, not just those working on um, the same time and place as I am, which I, I know some people are here. So the English print trade from inception in the 15th century and for some 200 years afterwards is often thought of as printing houses and bookshops, mostly located within a few places in London. Many of these are well known, such as Paternoster Row, St Paul's Churchyard and Fleet Street, and there is a romantic a not totally untrue image uh, of the print trade clustered together in the capital streets under the shadow of Paul's Cathedral, uh, which is shown here in, in the centre of this map. Indeed, it was in London that almost all domestic printing was done and where most of the country's bookshops were. It was also the London Guild, the company of stationers, which theoretically regulated the trade across the country. Their members were known as stationers, uh, but were variously printers, booksellers and bookbinders. 
and there has been excellent spatial work exploring the look and layout of bookshops and printing houses, as well as their placement within London's urban fabric. Uh, for example, by Blaney and Johns, uh, by James Raven, uh, who was mentioned in the call for papers for this conference, uh, and Coker's recent article, which theorised space in the English printing house as a gendered sphere. From this strong foundation, we can expand our horizon as London was no island. For one thing, there were booksellers and bookbinders across the country, printing at Oxford and Cambridge, and of course, an important import market. Without disputing the centrality of London bookshops and printing houses, we can place them within a wider environment. McCulloch believes that the historiography of kinship and regional alliances outside London could have significant ideological implications for the book trade plied within it. And it is towards such a historiography that this paper aims. So, what's in a will? Last wills and testaments are excellent for this. Uh, they show people within a wide and complex social and spatial fabric, their friends and family, with reference to where they lived, uh, the land and houses they owned, sometimes down to specific rooms, uh, or even specifying their burial plot. Uh, this paper takes over 100 wills proved between 1600 and 1641 in the Prerogative Court of Canterbury, which was the highest probate court in southern England and where most stationers' wills were proved in this period. The paper will outline what these wills have to say about the environments of the trade, moving from what they can add to our understanding of the immediate physical spaces to how they can place stationers within their wider world. In the first instance, sites of print trade and productions are well referenced in these wills. William Shefford left to his wife Elizabeth the lease of his shop in Pope's Head Alley with books and papers. John Haviland left his printing house and his materials thereof. John Smethick bequeathed to his son all my books in choirs at home or elsewhere, the elsewhere being stocking and other shop, no doubt. And we must also think of the trade not just as where books were made or sold, as Rick, Richard Uckholt refers to his counting house, uh, which would have been a key site of business. Now we'll set the test data within a place by identifying where they belong. Um, and if they do this often at the very beginning of the document. A common bequest was to give money to the poor of local parish, uh, with Edward Agas given to the poor of Bailey Quarter in the parish of St. Sepulchre at uh, 20 shillings in bread. Uh, testators often had multiple properties, uh, for example, Nicholas Sheffield was renting uh, two messages, uh, two houses uh, and little yards in Hornsatch near Woolsack Alley in St Botolph without Aldgate, uh, which for those of you who know uh, early modern London um, is an incredibly specific uh, detail. Uh, Richard Field named his shop as Displayed Eagle and said there were other buildings around it. And Edward Agus referred to my two leases, the one in Trinity Alley and the other at the Sign of the Sun at the head of Turnagain Alley on Swan Hill. Uh, again, uh, very specific uh, directions there. Now, the real purpose of this paper is to extend our picture of the trade beyond this. Uh, there was a physical world uh, in which it was not just of the trade. Uh, the print trade existed, uh, choirs and printing tools um, alongside you know, guns and beer bowls. Um, there are numerous bequests which highlight stationers living within physical spaces, not just trade ones. John Sharp gave to his cousin Elizabeth Rogers uh, the lead cistern and other things of mine in the kitchen, um, quite literally everything, including the kitchen sink. Uh, the bookseller Edward Jordan gave to his son Falk his shop uh, with all the stables, haylofts and chambers therein, uh, as well as the nags, uh, the horses in the stables, uh, showing how spaces for the trade coexisted uh, with all kinds of other spaces. In the time remaining, I'd like to show the range of practical and emotional connections that print trade people had beyond London. And this ranged from houses such as Richard Sergius, uh, who had a, a house in Staines, uh, John Budge, who left my lands and tenements at Kells Hill in the parish of Marks Hall, Essex. Uh, stationers also gave to places of their birth, uh, underlining how many people in the London trade came from across the country uh, and retained lifelong ties to the places they came from. Uh, John Hodgetts gave to the poor of Sedgley Parish in Staffordshire, where I was born, 60 shillings. Uh, William Barringer gave for the building of so many almshouses 
for the poor men of Stevington in Bedfordshire, where I was born. Uh, and these, uh, these houses actually still exist. Uh, the link between places of birth could also mirror current trade links, such as William Stansby, who gave to the poor of the parish of St. Mary the Moor in Exeter, where I was born, five pounds. Uh, and also his friend, John Mungwell of Exeter, bookseller, three pounds. Of course, wills come from people outside London as well. Uh, Ralph Morden was a bookbinder in Stamford in Lincolnshire. Uh, Edward Jordan, uh, who I've mentioned before, was a bookseller in Worcester. Uh, and he gave a fantastic sense of his location, uh, the content of his shop, uh, when he left to his son, uh, all and singular my books and wares relating to my trade of bookselling, which were in my shop on the fourth street of the Messuage, wherein I now dwell, and also all my other books in any part of my said house. And I've marked on here uh, some of the, the places mentioned in, in these wills, um, just the ones that I've referenced in this talk. To underline the connectedness of early 17th century England, um, I've got here an image of the cartograph, which is being constructed by the VI Regii project to map the transport network of England, Wales from 1530 to 1680. England was an interconnected place. As well as these people named in wills, we must also consider the network of people which connected them, uh, the carters, carriers, chapmen and women uh, who carried these things uh, along the roads. Uh, the English print trade was also connected to the rest of the world. Uh, and I'd like to end just by thinking about some of the most interesting places uh, I found mentioned in the wills of stations. Now, two stations period uh, between 1614 and 1641 uh, had their wills proved on East Indiamen, uh, ships bound for the East Indies. Uh, Thomas Adicott on the Dragon in 1680 and Roger Pott who made his will in 1636 on the East Indiamen Palsgrave. Uh, I can't see about Adicott uh, but Pott had begun a career in the trade um, and their attempts and actions really need more work um, as we think about some of these connections. Um, we know more about the bequest of George Swinhow, uh, which he leaves uh, all my two shares of land in the Summer Island beyond the seas in Warwick Tribe, containing 50 acres of land with all buildings and appurtenances, uh, sort of outhouses and things. Uh, the Summer Island was Bermuda. Um, we've got a, a picture here, uh, and I've had the kind help actually of, of Neil Kennedy, 44, uh, in Warwick Tribe, uh, which is the uh, area there indicated by the arrow. Um, and this was in uh, Richard Norwood's 1622 survey, so shortly before Swinhow died. Uh, apparently this was quite good land, um, but Swinhow never seems to have, have uh, developed it. Um, and this is a common uh, complaint by the company to its shareholders. Uh, Swinhow was named as one of the original investors in 1615, alongside William Welby, who was another stationer. Uh, Welby was an, also an investor in the Virginia Company uh, in North America. Uh, and he actually, uh, Welby, published work singing the praises of both places. Um, so actually, we've got a link here seeing how colonial ownership could influence what was printed back in London. So we've travelled quite a long way from the, the printing houses and bookshops in the shadow of Paul's Cathedral, um, physically and, and hopefully conceptually. Uh, as we think more deeply about the range of spaces and places that influence the trade and, and vice versa, uh, we can conceptualise print production within a vibrant environment. The horizons of the early modern English print trade were broad, and although London was a centrifugal point, most people were born and lived much of their early life away from the metropolis, and many held links to a wide range of places during their lives, uh, which influenced them, uh, and likely they influenced those places. There's a lot more work to do, uh, hopefully not all by me. Uh, I'd love any questions. Uh, I've put my email up here. Um, so please do get in touch. Um, thanks very much everyone for listening uh, and uh, thank you everyone uh, for all your work organizing this. Um, it's great to be part of such an exciting event. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Maria Klopcher. Dr. Klopcher is a senior researcher from the Institute of Ethnomusicology at the research, research center of the Slovenian Academy of Science, CISET, Arts. Her research interests include ritual songs, ballads, and soldier songs with an emphasis on the social context. 
Her monograph on the way to Kamik from 2016 explores relations between folklore and everyday life with particular attention to differences between town and village and the way they are reflected in the songs of the region. She has also researched the roles of men and women in the transmission of ballads and inter cultural relations, bilingual songs, songs transferred from one linguistic community to another, and itinerant singers, including blind singers. Her book, Listen to My Voice, Itinerant Singers in Slovenia, was published last year in April. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Klopcer, the virtual floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. I will start with my PowerPoint presentation. Okay. I will talk about uh, Slovenian lands and the broadsides in connection with singing. In 1876, Slovenian historian Peter Radic, with the help of his friend, bought an important broadside in an auction in Vienna. It was the broadside with the song Ein neues Lied von den Kreinerischen Bauern, a new song about the Carniolan, Carniolan peasants, which refers to the great Slovene peasant revolt of 1515. When Radic bought this broadside, only two not entirely identical issues were known to exist, one in Berlin and one in, on, in the south of German antique, in one of German antique shops. A new song about Carniolan peasants written after the peasants' defeat is a report on how the uprising, which the authorities defined as an atrocity, was subdued. It was intended to spread the news of this event in the German speaking environment. For the Slovenians, however, a new song about Carniolan peasants is the most important song printed on broadside. It quotes the slogans of the Slovenian peasant armies, specifically the rebellious slogan Stara Prauda, Old Rights. It was a demand for the restitution of the peasants' rights. And the slogan, Lokup, 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 Bogagmaina, come together, come together, your poor commons, which called on the peasants to unite and join the uprising. These are the first printed words in Slovenian language. From the 16th century onward, Ljubljana became an important center for communicating news in Central Europe. Due to its important geostrategic location close to the Ottoman Empire, news dissemination played an important role in the Slovenian speaking environment. Song broadsides, known as Neuzeitungen, conveyed news of battles against the Ottoman Turks and others. The expression Neuzeitungen indicates the role of German language in Slovenian lands. They were mostly part of the Habsburg Empire and the German language had important role. In the official news dissemination, which was the responsibility of the authorities, Slovenian was first used at the end of the 18th century, whereas in the practice of spreading news in the form of songs, it attained its proper place during the establishment of the Illyrian provinces. Several propaganda songs, either militia songs or songs period, including the drinking song, Notar Zitje Mista Paris, Parisa, the occupation of Paris. Uh, we can see here uh, at the bottom of the uh, second side that the song was composed and sung in Kamnik. It's a small town uh, in the central part of Slovenia. Here the question arises not only as to the existence, but also as to the preservation of the leaflets. There were two reasons for the preservation of this particular song. 
It is written in Slovenian and it has an important message. It refers to an important historical event. For the same reasons, the language and the content, some examples of songs with religious content have been preserved. On the other hand, Slovenian folk song research did not encourage interest in broadsides because it was believed that associating broadsides which song, with song traditions was detrimental to the folk character of the songs. In the comprehensive uh, collection Slovenske Narodne Pismi Slovenian folk songs, many songs have been excluded as non-folk. Publication on broadsides was an important reason for the exclusion of song. This kind of selectivity is apparent from an annotation made by Karel Strick, the, the editor of the collection, who noted next to the song Turki Predunajem, the siege of Vienna by the Turks. I quote, this is sung about in another song that I do not think is a folk song. It was probably created after a German historical song that was spread on the so-called Fliegende Blätter broadsides. On the one hand, this remark testifies to the existence of broadsides among the Slovenians. On the other hand, it points to the connection of broadsides which, with folk songs. So let us move on to these questions. In the oldest collection of Slovenian folk songs, Slovenske Pismi Krajinskega Narodja, Slovenian songs of the Kerniola. And people entitled in political exile in Ljubljana at that time. The song about the Lisbon earthquake brought the story of a tragic event in the distant place unknown to the majority of the Slovenians. By the way, one, uh, this uh, earthquake was one of the deadliest earthquakes uh, between 30,000 and 50,000 people died, um, mostly because of the tsunami. The inclusion of these songs mm -hmm. in the Slovenian National Folk Song Collection shows Kuritko's broad conception of folk songs. Uh, it is interesting because collecting folk songs had the role of national identification. And in the following decades, this role was all the more important. Aware of the consequences of German pressure, collectors sought out the songs that represented the lives of the Slovenians and those associated with the Slovenians. So the songs about the Lisbon earthquake were not included in the next collection of Slovenian folk songs. The editor Karel Strickel, who was very consistent in eliminating song with a clear foreign influence, may have suspected that this song had a connection with the broadside. He was right. In 1933, 20 years after his death, the Slovenian public became acquainted with a song about the Lisbon earthquake, which was printed on a leaflet. The song of the, here we see this song uh, of the horror of the earthquake as it was printed on the leaflet, but uh, it is not the leaflet, it's just the text uh, from, taken from the article. The leaflets have uh, been preserved in the private library of the family of the Slovenian writer Ivan Taucher at Visoko Mansion near Škov. The journalist Anton, Anton de Beliak, who published an article about it, emphasized the connection of this song with folk songs. Here we could have followed these uh, words and these similarities, but uh, we don't have time. Uh, so, but we can see clearly the song from the leaflet was very similar to the second song of Lisbon earthquake in Koritko's, Koritko's collection. Another interesting version was preserved in one of the song books of the organ player Jozef Ambrožić. Here it is. This version shows the performative role of the song. In the first strophe, it invites people to listen to the story of the disaster in Lisbon, which is used as an example. 
This version shows that the song of Lisbon earthquake was not only shared between the people, it points to the performer, to the itinerant singer. The discovery of this leaf, uh, leaflet revealed the connection between broadsides and Slovenian folk songs. Yet this realization broadsides. The, the reason for the exclusion of such songs was not only the broadsides group singing, which was not intended for performance or payment. This view of the folk all flow also influenced the new comprehensive collection of Slovenian folks, despite the belief that Slovenians, and despite the assumption that singing at first did not develop so much among South Slavic nations due to the vitality of folk songs production, the third volume of the collection Slovenske Ljudske Pesmi, Slovenian Folk Songs, published the song Plimic Zapelivets, the nobleman's seducer, which is clearly based on a just the following. I quote, the model for this song is the German ballad Ritter und Macht, Night and Maid, or more precisely, a newer version of it that was disseminated in the 18th century, especially through Roadsides. Let us listen to this song. In this sound recording, it comes from the Institute of Ethnomusicology, Zaretsa Sazu. The impression of fair singing is preserved, but the story is very abbreviated. It only hints the act of love uh, uh, between the nobleman and the girl, but leaves us from I would not be denied. Through Corporization, these songs became an important part of the Slovenian folk ballad tradition. In the period of preparation of this collection, another testimony of a broadside appeared. It was the publication of the parody of the song of about St. Lucy, sung in Trieste in 1915. These broadsides did not refer to fair singing, but to the singing of a blind singer. Further research on this subject found evidence of fair singers. It was found in the personal memoir of a lawyer and translator, Josip Suhi, and uh, refers to an event in Kamnik. I don't think I have time to read it. This is a description of such a performance of a performance of a fair singer and uh, the selling uh, of broadsides. This description of, it is actually multimedia street performance, brought proof that fair singing also took place in Slovenian lands. Sing as well came to spread sensational news through songs. Benka uh, Zenger or Moritatler as they were called, these singers, performed these songs at town fairs largely in one of the same uh, at, and the same places. By singing songs about murders while pointing to a series of images depicted on canvas, they would first present the story and then sell it to the audience on broadsides. 
In Ljubljana, such singing took place in the front of Hotel Huber, the building is still existing. It was close to the previous Lyceum. The songs about sensational events were largely these connections are also visible in the expression used, such as Benkazang for bench song or Benkazang. You can see the German and then the use of Slovenian. Um, this change was somehow made in, uh, in the middle of the 19th century and came with uh, greater political rights of the Slovenians. In the early 1870s, just before the decline of singing at first, German language performances were replaced by those that performed murder ballads in Slovenian. In Ljubljana National and University Library, two Slovenian Moritat ballads are preserved, which the Bavarian singer Puls had printed in Ljubljana and presented or sold on School Avenue, Šolski Drevorit, behind Ljubljana Lyceum. One of them is the Moritat ballad about the robber and murderer Tropman. Uh, it's a real story. It occurred in 1870. This murderer was captured and, and uh, publicly executed by a guillotine. And his murder's trial and execution were widely reported in the French press. For instance, Le Petit Journal, the best selling newspaper in France, more than doubled its daily circulation, selling nearly. Uh, 600,000 copies on the day of Tropman's execution. We have uh, no evidence that the song about Tropman was sung among the Slovenians, but uh, here is uh, the song and the description of uh, the song. Uh, but so we don't have evidence that the song was sung, but uh, we do know that the news was spread by the broadside, a means of communication for information between different countries. Nevertheless, broadsides were an important presence in Slovenian territory as well, and some of these songs entered the Slovenian folk tradition. I will conclude with a song we started with, this is the song about the Carniolan peasants, which was intended to inform Germans, the speaking audience about the Slovenian peasant revolt uh, of 1515. By way of uh, broadsides, a new song about the Carniolan peasants entered the canon of German folk songs. So uh, it was not, not just our tradition, which was marked by broadsides. In 1844, this song was included in the first book of Ludwig Uhland's, Uhland's collection, Alte Hoch und Niederdeutsche Volkslieder. So the collection of old German songs. The process of authorization preserved in this way the negative. Um, hi, we don't have a lot of time for all the <laughs> questions, so, so, but I will try to read them more. <laughs> Uh, first for, uh, for, for Kirsten, uh, one of our attendee, Ms. Bale, wondered if you could contextualize the Northwest area in terms of its reality literacy. How does it compare, for example, with other regions in terms of the literacy of its population? Your argument about the primacy of reality presumably fits with what Adam Smith has established. Question mark. Kingdoms. It depends who you talk to, really. 
Um, if you talk to somebody like Adam Martindale and um, mm -hmm. and the, the, the ministers of Presbyterian classes, they saw Lancashire and Cheshire as part of the sort of dark part of England where it was seen as quite remote. Um, but that's their prejudice on that part of the world mm -hmm. because they wanted to propagate the gospel. Catholicism was still quite strong in that area. And of course, Britain being a Protestant country um, and being Presbyterian ministers, they wanted to propagate the gospel. So I think in terms of my paper, um, you're dealing with the prejudice of those ministers against the area in which they're operating. Um, uh, what what is what is interesting is I think that there is um, I mean I don't know about about the areas specifically in terms of literacy, but what I do know is that there are a lot of booksellers who are actually members of the Manchester classes. So there are, are obviously booksellers in Manchester, which would suggest that you know there is literacy in the northwest of England. But again, as I say, it depends who you talk to and the networks in which you operate in, in, in that sense. Um, so um, I don't know if that helps answer the question, but I just wanted to highlight that maybe, as I say, there, there's prejudice there from the point of view of the ministers that we're, we're dealing with, that they think they're in a, what they would call a dark corner of England that is backward and they, from their perspective um, in terms of of literacy and all that, and, and maybe not as bad as they think it is, if that makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Joe, question for you. Uh, were there lists of inventories with possible brief description of, of print shop artifacts in the wheels or instructions for the next generation, as was as was recently published by Christoph Seleschlag in the journal The Golden Compasses on Balthazar Plant in Mauritius in 1659 uh, to 1673. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I've not read the article actually, but I, I did read uh, or I listened to, to Christoph's work before at conferences, um, which is excellent. Uh, there. Briefly, yes, there, there are some instructions and, and um, unfortunately the, 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 the nature of wills uh, on one hand is that we get an excellent insight that, that doesn't appear in official records, but the flip side of that is the will isn't intended to tell us all about the print trade, so what we do get are often little snapshots, uh, so we do, yes, get uh, some descriptions of areas where printing materials were held, um, but very rarely um, and um, sort of a sense of, of what was to be done, you know, instructions regarding stock, um, regarding um, sort of the movement of materials, um, sometimes references to partnerships and things. Um, but to get all of these, we have to look at a lot. So I've looked at 100 wheels so far from 1600 to 1641, and I'm hoping to look at about 400 wheels over the course of the century from around 1550 to 16. 50, 16, 60-ish. So um, hopefully I'll be able to answer that more fully uh, another paper. Okay, thank you. And the question from Maria. Maria, uh, one of our, uh, um, Ms. Ms. McShane would like to ask uh, uh, about to consider how far the song uh, you discussed deliberately functioned to create and activate protest, which uh, it seems to have done rather than to disseminate news, which seems much more passive. Uh, what do you think? Well, uh... I found, thank you, I found some songs, some folk songs and uh, about the protest, uh, for instance, about the, or the revolution in 1848. And it's, it very clearly shows that uh, these were uh, songs which were distrib distributed in this way. So uh, in folk songs stayed some old protest songs but uh, the research has to go in another way. So uh, we have to seek for these leaflets uh, from folk song. 
but uh, yeah. I cannot well give an answer how many songs or such songs we had because um, well I, I don't think think it's um, possible to uh, find them in this way all of them some of them stayed that's the problem there was a selection uh, in they went to, into oblivion uh, when they were not interesting anymore for the people. Mm -hmm. If they were not preserved somehow. Okay. Uh, question for Joe. Uh, was involvement in the early modern print trade something that was transmitted through families? And is there evidence of widows taking over uh, from their husbands? Uh, yes, uh, firstly, very strongly, um, a lot of um, passing through families um, directly and indirectly in the trade. Uh, and regarding widows, uh, yes, very much so. Um, there's been a lot of work done uh, by uh, Maureen Bell, uh, who's here, uh, Ellen Smith, uh, there was a, an excellent edited collection out last year uh, by Valerie Wayne, uh, Women's Labour and the History of Book in Early Modern England. Um, so we're probably at the point now where we're arguing not just that um, widows took over, but, but actually were that women were involved throughout the process, you know, that they swayed their husband, made publishing decisions with and without uh, men present. Thank you. Thank you all for the presentations to and all the questions sent by the, the attendees. Thank you. And, uh, and now uh, this is the, the end of our, our session.